Welcome to Prosperous Lives, the show where we hear stories from people in different careers and ask them one question, what does it take to be in your shoes? On today's episode, we have Diego. He was able to turn his artistic hobby into a full-time career and is now a creative director. So let's roll that interview. Thank you, Diego, for being on my podcast today. Absolutely. Could you give us a short bio about who you are and what you do? Sure thing. Um, I am a creative director and uh, and graphic designer. I right now I work with um, with two different companies, uh, serving as creative director, leading uh, the creative efforts of uh, the writers, designers, videographers, developers, web developers. And uh, basically, I lead creative strategy. So I collaborate with the team to sit down, a brainstorm, um, and arrive at an overall creative direction for whatever given project that is that we have in our hands. And um, then once the direction is agreed upon, approved by the accounts team and by the client, then I lead the team on the actual execution of that creative strategy and bringing all those creative assets that were agreed upon to, to life. Could you talk to us about how did you come to become a creative director and what was some of your past job? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when I, when I got out of high school, um, I really had no, no, no career path. I was very, um, very lost when it came to, to careers. I basically ended up getting, various kinds of sales jobs and things like that. And um, somewhere along that time frame of my life, uh, somebody, a friend of mine that I was living with at the time, he started realizing that just as a hobby, I spent a lot of time creating things on Photoshop, you know, just uh, on an amateur basis. I kind of taught myself how to use Photoshop and I would edit, you know, photos and make photos funny or cool looking or whatever for friends. I even started doing some uh, some favors for people that I knew creating business cards and creating logos. Again, I had no training, no formal training. And this friend of mine, you know, he started asking me, have you ever thought about turning this into a career? And while I always loved art, I always loved everything that had to do with creativity, I never really considered a career in art because, I don't know, I think I just didn't have anybody in my life ever stop me and tell me, you can turn this talent into something that, that you can make a living off of. I don't, I don't recall ever having, you know, a school counselor or anybody uh, make that connection between career and my artistic talents. So, um I started talking with him about that and it got me curious. Then I went back and started talk, talking to my wife at the time about the idea of, you know, by this point, I'm in my early 20s still. So I wasn't, uh, you know, way past um, college age necessarily. Then again, what is college age nowadays? People are going back to back to college at all kinds of ages. Uh, but I felt like I was past that time. I felt like I was past that, 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 that era of my life in a way. And so, um, you know, she encouraged me as well. And she said that she was willing to, um, to adapt to me going back to school and just figuring out that part of our lives while I formalize a career in creative services. So that's what I did. I enrolled in the Art Institute. Um, and while I was there, I basically started working with companies, these two nonprofits that I was working for during that span of like three and a half years. Um, I offered my, my services, my creative services for free to them just so that I could put into practice everything that I was learning in school and so that I could create a real world portfolio so that by the time I graduated, I walked out of there with actual examples that I did for real companies. And that worked very well. Um, so basically what ended up happening is that right after I graduated from the Art Institute in, um, in their digital design program, uh, a former coworker of mine called me because he had gotten this opportunity to become general manager at a metal distribution company. And uh, he found out that I had graduated and he found out that, you know, I was now taking this into a formal career path. And so he offered to bring me on 
as kind of a half sales and half marketing job. And I jumped on the opportunity. So I worked there for about two years and I basically got the chance to rebrand that entire company. I got the chance to uh, create their website from scratch. I got the chance to create all of their marketing collateral. And that was kind of where I, it was my first, my first time jumping into things and being completely on my own and having the freedom to just, you know, bring a brand to life from scratch. And then from there on, I had a couple of more jobs. The, the next job after that, it was completely designed. So I was hired fully for graphic design. It wasn't a hybrid thing like the one like the one from the metal distribution company. Um, and then after that, I had enough experience after that second job that I was able to get my first job at a marketing company. This is all in Miami by the way, where I used to live uh, up to uh, about seven years ago. And um, and then that was that job at that marketing company is what really started turning things around for me. That led me to eventually go off to work on my own for a bit as a freelancer and contractor and um, eventually landed me the job at a marketing agency here in uh, in the Tampa Bay area, which is really where my career uh, took a huge uh leap forward in a way yeah so you mentioned to me that you that you went to an art institute could you talk the difference between an art institution and just going to a college and studying art like an art school yeah um well this is a the school it was called the art institute and um it was actually a very at the time, it was a very prestigious school. It was a school that uh, a private university that was um, recognized as, you know, one of the authorities in anything that had to do with with creative services, anything from, you know, graphic design to web design, which was really starting to grow at that time in 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 our society, um, fashion design, culinary arts. The art institute had a lot of different programs and. Um, the great thing about it, I think the greatest thing that the Art Institute gave me was this introduction into design culture, because while you can take a lot of programs in other colleges and universities that are, you know, design programs and you'll be able to graduate from them and you'll be able to get a degree and it can help you find work. The Art Institute, because of the fact that it was a school, that it was a university dedicated to creative work. It had connections in um, in the cities that, that they were in. This, this university had campuses throughout all the United States. And um, wherever you had an art institute, that school was typically going to be connected into the local art scene, connected into the local creative scene with marketing agencies, advertising agencies. And so by the time you graduate, you've had an opportunity to be, to be so um, submerged into the creative culture of your local area that it gave you, a, I feel, a better fighting chance to really get your career started. Your professors were usually people who had a, who either were actively uh, part of creative agencies or had been creative agencies, uh, creative agency, creative directors, art directors. Some of them even ran their own creative agency. So again, you just got a lot of real world, you know, feet on the ground experience on how the creative culture and your surroundings um, developed and, and, and what was going on locally in your creative scene. So I feel like that's the greatest thing that it gave me uh, as opposed to going to a, you know, a college that doesn't necessarily focus on creative services. Yeah. You also mentioned that you learned Photoshop before going to the Art Institute. How, how did you come um, about learning Photoshop? Well, um, <laughs> so I used to, um, I, you, you, do you know Microsoft Paint? Yeah. <laughs> so I used to, um, <clears throat> I used to use Microsoft Paint at work. I used to work at this call center uh, back in the day. And, you know, between calls, you're sitting there, you're waiting for this automatic, uh, this automated system to send you a new call. And uh, between calls, you know, you really have nothing else to do except sit there and wait. Some people read books, <clears throat> excuse me, some people um, 
Uh, some people read books. Some people were simply, uh, you know, passing the time just sitting there. And I decided to get on Microsoft Paint and I would do, I would draw these caricatures of my coworkers, you know, like funny looking little cartoons of my coworkers. And, um, and I started doing that and people were really getting a kick out of it. And everybody started coming around and giving me requests, <laughs> you know, like, Hey, can you draw my cousin? Can you draw my, my son, whatever. And, um, a friend of mine, the same guy that 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 eventually um, ended up encouraging me to turn it, turn all this into a career. He actually was the one that came to me and he told me one day at home, he was like, hey, man, do you know that there's a better program for this, a better application for this? And, and I asked him, what do you mean? What What's uh, what's out there? And he said, you know, there's this thing called Photoshop that is, you know, basically like Microsoft Paint. But, you know, on steroids, it's, you know, it can do a hundred more things than Microsoft Paint can do. And I was like, really? All right, show me, show me. So he uh, he got me a bootleg copy, a, you know, a legally downloaded copy at the time um, of uh, Photoshop. And he put it in the computer that we shared downstairs in the common area. And that was it, man. I The rest is history. I started going on, uh, you know, anywhere online that I could find tutorials. I started um, looking wherever I could find to learn how to use the tools on, on Photoshop. And it really became this sandbox where I would love to go and just play whenever I got the opportunity. And I would, uh, you know, be out and about. And I always carried cameras with me because I've always loved photography just on an amateur basis. But I would take pictures all the time. And then I found ways of doing creative stuff with those photos. And that was really, again, just a hobby. But but that was, uh, I feel like those were the beginnings of me starting to see more structure to art. Because that was the first time that I really saw art in that way. Before, it was just this free form, free hand thing that I could do on paper, you know, no boundaries. But when you're working within a digital space, there's there's rules that you have to follow. But it also comes along with these capabilities that you simply don't have when you're just making stuff on paper. So that, that that's how I got into that. Yeah. So you also mentioned that you helped one of your friends start their website from scratch and you built, you did a bunch of marketing stuff for them. And you also were a graphic designer. Which one did you enjoy more? Uh, graphic design, for sure. So basically, um, when I enrolled in the Art Institute, I remember that there was there was a point in your in your program in the art institute, if you if you signed up for um, what I uh, graduated with, which was uh, digital design, in that digital design program, there was a point where you hit a fork in the road, and you had to pick whether you're you had a whole bunch of uh, like basic courses that you took first, and then uh, you had to pick a path. You had to either go down the web design path or you have to go down the create the uh, graphic design path. And so if you chose the web design path from there on, you would be learning a lot more coding classes and a lot more, you know, you would go in depth into that entire programming coding world. Back then it was only HTML and CSS. Um, and then in the design path, you would focus more, you know, on everything that had to do with design and design culture and design software, and, um, you know, the, the skill set for it. So... I I think from very early on <clears throat> I had a I had a clarity that I had no interest in sitting down and staring at a wall of code <laughs> all day. Uh, I feel like um, I've worked with so many developers throughout the years now that I really have a high high level of respect for developers because you really have to be wired in a, in a specific way to love bringing things to life in that direction from that direction in that way it's i feel like with graphic design i am able to in the process of bringing something to life i'm constantly seeing something in front of me i'm constantly seeing the thing little by little you know being assembled but with coding there's so many long periods of time where you really are just staring at characters on a on a on a screen that it just doesn't have the same kind of reward for me. I love the process of seeing this thing slowly morph visually into the final piece. And that's why I, I, I think I lean, always have leaned more towards um, graphic design than, than towards development. Right now, as a creative director, how much of your job will actually be creative work and how much will it be coming up with strategies to develop a brand? The strategies are always there. So I, I always, that's always uh, part of my job. I always have to, you know, I have to lead that effort, right? Um, it's uh, with one of the companies, 
the uh, one of the companies that I that I'm employed by works with um, speakers. And so they basically take on people who want to become coaches or public speakers or, you know, experts in their area and, and, and book uh, speaking engagements. And um, they help them polish up their brand, their personal brand. They help them, you know, create a web presence if they don't have them or clean up their web presence and then create several marketing materials. And then they start booking opportunities for them to speak. And with that company, I... I'm always hands on creatively. So I'm not just contributing on the on the uh, strategy, uh, strategic side. Um, I also design a whole bunch of the uh, a whole bunch of the materials. I think it's a little bit easier in that sense, because it's kind of we're working on either one or two speakers at a time. We don't. We never have a huge volume of um, of speakers that are that are uh, requiring work at the same time. That's just the nature of how that company works. They always work with one to two people at a time. So there, I'm constantly involved in actually doing design work, which. I love branding is a passion to me. It's something that I legitimately enjoy and I think will always enjoy no matter where my career goes. And in the other company, it's a little bit different. In the other company, um, the dynamic has always been more me on the strategic side and then leading the the execution of those strategies with designers, writers, developers, uh, videographers, if it calls for, for video work. Um, so yeah, it's uh, have both. I have a little bit of both worlds. I think uh, with these two companies that I work for. Okay, yeah, you mentioned that developing a brand is your passion. So when you are developing a new brand, where do you start? Um, I start with the uh, whatever the uh, the original dream was. You know, every every company started off with some kind of idealistic vision. You know, they started off with a passion. Every organization typically stems from someone's dream. And I feel that so long as what the company is doing in the present is still in some way a reflection of that origin, then I always like to tap back into that because normally the people, the business owner will have given the business a certain name because it's inspired by that vision. They will have established certain visuals that people will become accustomed to identifying that brand by um, also stemming from that original vision. So I always feel that if I if I'm able to tap into what that original vision was, what that dream for that business was, I'm able to bring to life a new brand identity that represents a spirit of the business. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you if you could give one piece of advice to someone who's about to start a company, what would you give them so that their brand becomes recognized? Um, start from the beginning, from the foundation. Start with start working with professionals to bring your brand to life. I think that um, a lot of people, especially nowadays where you can go on, you know, fiber.com and get a logo for five bucks. There's a lot of there's a there's this misconception that the value that a professional designer brings to the table is strictly a good looking logo. And that's not the truth. You know, the truth is that if you're working with a professional designer or professional um, brand designer, logo designer, you're going to get much more value than just the thinking of, will this thing look good on a website and will it look good on my business card? You're going to get the perspective of, is this, is this logo timeless? You know, is this logo going to stand stand the test of time or am I going to be looking to redesign and rebrand my company two years down the road because, you know, the trend of this design passed, it's no longer relevant. Uh, you're going to start, you're going to get somebody who's going to think about the application of the logo, color palette and typography to everything that you're going to do from your website to your business cards, to your marketing collateral, to, uh, you know, whatever else it is that represents your brand. You're going to be getting somebody who is thinking about it's about uh, dr- writing down a defined brand voice. How does this brand communicate, not just visually, but in, in writing, in how people refer to it, how the company is addressed, how the company is mentioned in publications or in uh, anywhere where, where the company's name appears. Whenever I'm designing a brand, I don't just deliver a nice looking logo. I deliver brand identity standards that take all these things into consideration. And my goal 
is for you to not have to come back to me, you know, to not have to rehire me to rebrand in two years because the, the information is no longer relevant. I like to create brands that are timeless. I like to create brands um, that have enough built in flexibility that no matter where the brand is communicating from, whether it's a social media profile or whether it's an email that you receive from the brand or whether it's a business card that you were handed in, at, at an event, everything has has been thought of beforehand. Even if those things are not going to come to life right away, I will give you the assets that you'll need pre-thought so that when the time comes, you have the the perfect spot, the perfect the perfect thing to apply, the perfect asset to apply um, to those cre- to those needs. And so, I feel like that's the value that a business owner would be getting if they go right from the gate with a professional instead of saying, I'll start off just doing it on my own or I'll ask my cousin to do it. And then some point along the road, I'll get it professionally made. You know, it's a big difference. Yeah. You talked about brand identity standard. Could you talk about more about that? Sure thing. Um, So basically when you create a brand uh, or to be more specific, when you create a logo, you know, if you just hand over that logo, the logo files uh, to your client, you're you're, you're kind of shortchanging them because you you're telling them, OK, here is here's a new car. Right. But I'm not training you on how to drive it. I'm not training you on what the rules of the road are. I'm just giving you this beautifully designed piece of machinery that you have no clue how to use. The brand standards or brand guidelines, it goes by different names, um, has the, 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 the purpose of telling the, the, the business owner and anybody that the business owner works with, here's this logo, here's what led to the creation of this logo. Um, here's a color palette that, is, that was established through the logo and that you should use moving forward on anything that your business has that represents it visually. The color palette will include things like the different color values um, for each color swatch that represents their brand. So it'll give you codes for CMYK, which is meant for printing. It'll give you codes like RGB, which is meant for um, screen screens, digital ski, uh, screens. Uh, things like uh, the Pantone color codes, which are uh, meant for... Uh, it's a universal color matching system where, the, where you can go to a printer in China and say, here are my Pantone color codes. And by them printing in those colors, they'll be able to match exactly what you uh, would get somebody in the States, in the United States to print, for example. Um, it'll talk to you about typography. So it'll tell you, here are the typefaces that you should use for headings. Here are the typefaces that you should use for body copy. Um It'll talk to you about the essence of your brand. So things like what is your brand personality? What is your brand voice? Um, When your company is being mentioned in writing, how should it be addressed? You know, should it be, uh, you know, ABC Furnishings Inc. or should it be just ABC Furnishings? Or is it okay for your company to be called ABC at at some times? Um, It'll talk about how to use other assets like photography, how to use, how to be represented on social media. Um, I mean, all sorts of applications that are really different for each business, depending on what industry the business is in. But they're incredibly useful to make sure that there is consistency in how your brand is being represented. And brand standards or brand guidelines is something that I always vouch for. And if I'm starting to work with a company that doesn't have them, then I work with them to establish them because then that's your rule book. You know, that's the rules of the road. That's your instruction manual. And that's how you're going to make sure that you're using that new vehicle in an appropriate way, if that makes sense. Let's say I'm starting a tennis shoe company, right? And w- what type of logo would you would you say you recommend? A subtle logo or more of a pop logo? I think the more iconic that your logo can be, the better. And by iconic, I mean that it's easily represented in either one visual or that it's represented in very, very few words. So you see, you know, the most successful... Um, apparel companies or the most successful um, shoe companies in this case, in the case of this example. I mean, let's look at the ones that have stood the test of time. You know, you've got Nike, you've got Adidas, um, you've got company. Those two companies right there are companies that have ventured into all sorts of 
corners of the shoe industry and of fashion overall. Um, and they're all, both of them are represented by two very clean, very simple, iconic logos that you recognize anywhere. And yes, they've had all these years to build up their brand, but the fact that the, the their logos are so simple, just the Nike swoosh, the check mark, that is iconic in and of itself. And when you see that, you immediately think Nike. Uh, and then I, Adidas, the three stripes, right? That's something that they've used not only for their logo, but they've used it in their apparel, right? You see the three stripes running down the sleeves of your, you know, your sports jacket or if you're, uh, or your sports, uh, you know, uh, shirt or whatever, or down your shorts, the sides of your shorts, right? So it's like these subtle, very just iconic single image type of branding elements that are in everything they make. And that that end up becoming synonymous with the company name and what the company stands for and the quality of products that they make. The more minimal that a logo can be, the better chance it has of establishing that uh, that recognized status, that recognition as a brand. So in, in that example specifically, I would go pretty simple with something very iconic like like those two companies have. Could you give us uh, some some other examples of where like a, a where a, a type of industry will need a simple logo much more than a more of a pop logo? Yeah. Um, look at the evolution of Starbucks. You know, when you when you look at Starbucks and you look at their first logo, uh, their first logo is very much like an illustration. It's like a drawing of a siren of a mermaid. And it has a ton of details. The, the drawing itself showed the entire mermaid's body. It showed a whole bunch of details around her. And then you know, around that was that big circle band that had the name Starbucks Coffee Company. And you look at the evolution of that logo beyond that point, and you see how little by little they started realizing, like, uh, maybe we don't need the company. Let's drop company now it's just starbucks coffee then the next iteration might have something like wait you know this mermaid it it has so much detail that on some places where we put that logo it's hard to know what you're looking at necessarily let's simplify that so then they created a more uh uh shape-based simple clean illustration something that was more abstract than trying to like show a literal mermaid on um, as part of their logo then eventually they dropped the starbucks the the coffee part and they just started being known as starbucks then eventually you see the logo starting to zoom in basically into the mermaid's face where at first they were showing still parts of the tail and then little by little it just got closer and closer cropped into the mermaid's head and that gets to the most modern version of the starbucks logo which doesn't even have words around it <laughs> It just has the head of the mermaid encased in a green, uh, in in a green circle, and their iconic green, and that has now become the face of Starbucks. Obviously, they have other brand elements that play along with that. There is still the word Starbucks spelled out with a star um, over a certain spot, but they've become this very, very simplified branding system. And I feel like a lot of companies, the companies that have stood the test of time, they little by little realize that that is a direction, the best direction to head in. Same thing with Apple, right? When Apple started out, their logo, very first logo, showed, it was an illustration as well, and it showed uh, the tree where Newton was sitting underneath when the apple hit his head and he got the you know whole uh, revelation of, uh, what was it, of gravity and whatnot. But little by little, that Apple logo got much more simplified. Uh, eventually, it became just one Apple logo with the word Apple computer beneath. And uh, then the logo got stripped away of color. And then it became a solid, one solid color. Then eventually, they did away with the computer part of it. It was just the Apple and the word Apple. Then eventually, they did away with the word Apple completely. And now the logo is one of the most iconic things that you could possibly find in our society. Uh, it's on, you know, so many people's phones when they're staring at you or taking a picture of you, you're subliminally looking at that logo all the time. And again, that's a perfect example of another company that went from a very complex logo down to a very, very simplified logo because our brains don't retain 
100 percent of the information that we come across, not even 50 percent of the information that we come across. You know, the fact is that we don't remember a ton of details from what we experience throughout the day and our memories come in flashes. If you notice, our memories come in little bursts of imagery that we remember from certain situations, the more complex the thing that you came across that day, the least likely it is that you'll remember that you'll remember it in its entirety. So when you're in the advertising game, when you're in the marketing game, in the branding game, the more simple it is th- that you can, the more simply that you can represent a brand in front of a person's eyes, the more likely it is, because again, simplicity is easier to retain than complexity. The more likely it is that you're going to have people starting to recognize and remember your brand if it's a simple thing to, to, to take in and to process into memory. That's a great response. When you're making a creative decision, how influenced are you by the trends that are going on right now? Oh man, that's always a <laughs> that's always a tough one for for designers because when you take on a client, um, that client is usually already developing an idea in their minds of what they want, uh, you know, visually to represent their brand. And when you come across that situation, what ends up happening is that you see that the the client's perception of what they're expecting to see has already been influenced by whatever it is that they're seeing around them that is going on trend wise. And so if you take it back to like the early 2000s, there was this trend uh, in design that started uh, going around this thing called Web 2.0. And uh, it was, (laughs) how can I describe it? It was like this trend of designing logos and designing graphics that looked shiny. I think it's the best way that I can describe it. Like all the logos had, you know, gradients. And then they had these like slivers, these lines of shine, like you would see on a window or something like that, like a line going across that represented like a glossy look to it. It almost looked like all the logos were made out of glass, basically. And this thing was so pervasive uh, in, in design culture during that time. And every client that I would come across during that time period immediately wanted to, wanted something that looked like that because it looked like, it looked like a logo, like you could lick the logo. It looked like it was candy, you know, and people wanted that, you know, people wanted that logo with all the gradients and with all the, you know, that glossy looking thing that the glass effect to it. And that was a trend that was doomed to fail. (laughs) <laughs> that was a trend that was simply not going to stand the test of time. And um, for me, it was it was particularly difficult because I, I learned from very early on, there was this um, designer who passed away a few years back. His name is Massimo Vignelli. And he uh, he stressed simplicity over everything when it came to design. Um, and he was a great influence for me uh, when I when I was starting to get into the design, the creative field. He um, he came from Italy, and he when he got to New York City, and he designed the subway system for New York City. Not the engineering side of it, but the actual like like the signage and stuff like that. And it was a subway system signage that was extremely iconic. And I think New York didn't replace it until very recently. And he created this entire design system for that thing, how the signs were going to look, what typography they were going to use, how to use color. He did something very bold, which was that in the maps of the subway system, he didn't literally literally represent all the train lines as they actually were, because there were tons of curves and things and swiggles um, that those trains took uh, to get from point A to point B. He basically created a map that it was kind of like an idealized version of that map. And he used a lot of straight lines. So even though what was actually going on underground was not straight lines. He did it that way with the user in mind so that the user could very easily take in the main point, which was, okay, I'm in point A. Here's how I get to point B by taking this train. He used color in a very, very strategic way um, to bring that entire thing to life. Point is he created that thing and then it stood for decades and decades. It was something timeless. And he, 
didn't go with you know trends and anything that he did. He created also the Ameri- the first American Airlines logo, which that thing lasted. I think it must have been something like fifty years or some ridiculous amount of time without ever being changed until American Airlines changed it for. I'm not sure what reason, uh, not too long ago, maybe like three, four years back or something like that. And his focus was timelessness. His focus was never move according to the trends. Go with what is classic. Go with what is timeless in your typography choices, in your color choices, in your logo structure and design, because that is what is ultimately going to give the best value to your client. And so that influenced me a lot. His way of thinking influenced me a lot. And when it came around to, you know, different trends that have happened throughout the years, like this web 2.0 thing, I had to fight with clients. I really did. I had to, you know, push back on them and kind of stand my ground and tell them, look, if, you know, if this is what you want, there are plenty of designers out there to give it to you, but I'd, I'd love to provide you with a brand identity that isn't going to go out of style in two years, you know? So that's something that that's always been very important for me. Um, There's been different trends that have happened since then. And I try my hardest for myself and for the teams that I, that I've led to always stay outside of that, outside of anything that could possibly, you know, go out of style in X amount of years, uh, because it's ultimately a disservice, I think, to to the client to go with the trends. So what do you think are the secrets to, behind getting where you are today? Um, I think it's uh, a combination of not being afraid to take on new challenges and new creative challenges and walking through open doors in, in my career. I feel like sometimes um, doors might open in front of us. We might, uh, you know, we might have X or Y opportunity. For example, back at the beginning of my career, um, when I was giving my services away for free to these two nonprofits that I was working for while I was in school, I wasn't getting paid for that. All of that was extra time. All of that was, you know, extra work to do very late into the night because, again, I was in school as well. So I was doing schoolwork and, um, it was a lot of sacrifice. You know, that was a lot of sacrifice, but I did it with a goal in mind. I knew exactly why I was doing that. Yes, it was going to be free for them, but it was ultimately giving me something very valuable, which was a real world portfolio, which is by far, I think, the, the best tool that a designer has at their disposal. It's your portfolio. The more beefed up that that is, the higher quality that is, the more examples that that shows of real quality work, um, that could be infinitely more important than your resume. And I say that as somebody who has now, by this point in his career, hired several designers and several writers and several creatives of different of different fields. Um, you know, it got to a point where I really started just looking directly at the portfolio and ignoring the resume almost completely. Because if you didn't have the examples and the quality demonstrated visually in that portfolio, then I'm not going to be interested in the resume either. And um, so for me, it's it's been a it, it's been a combination of being willing to take some risk. Yes, some of the circumstances starting off are not going to be ideal. Yes, you may you may have to, you know, undersell yourself to start off, but get your foot in the door. You know, I think that that's something that never stopped me. I, I was always willing to do whatever it took to get my foot into the door, into that next door, to that next level, to that next opportunity. And I also didn't uh, turn a blind eye to doors that would open along the way. So if somebody came and said, hey, you know, are you interested? Would you be interested in this industry that, uh, that you know, may not seem too sexy or too interesting? You know, like the my first actual job, right? I, it was number one, it was in a metal distribution company. And if you've ever set foot in the metal dis- in the metal distributor's warehouse, there's not a lot of excitement going on. <laughs> you know, there's a ton of, of endless amounts of racks and shelves where there are long extrusions of metal, you know, sitting on top of each other, sheets of metal, um, you know, all sorts of metal all around you. And there's not that's not a very attractive thing to look at. And on top of that, 
the opportunity that was offered there because he couldn't uh, this uh, former colleague of mine, he couldn't justify hiring me only to do marketing and to do design. So he had to offer me this hybrid thing where I would do half of my job would be sales and half of my job would be marketing. Now, I I don't like sales. I've never liked sales. Um, and so I knew, OK, half of my job is going to suck for me. But what I'm getting in return is this this freedom, this nice situation where I'm going to be able to build a brand from the ground up completely with nobody really to tell me, hey, you know, I don't think that looks right because he didn't have any kind of artistic eye. He was completely business minded, but he was wise enough to know that he needed somebody to help him establish that brand. And so what I did is that I experimented. I played around with it, even though the situation wasn't ideal, even though I couldn't do what I wanted to do full time. uh, You know, I could have easily stood there and said, you know what, I'm not going to take this opportunity. Like, you know, I just graduated from the Art Institute. You know, I should be uh, being offered a full design job, you know, that sort of thing. But instead, I took the opportunity as a challenge and. I grabbed those things and I, I remember I spent a lot of time in the warehouse with the warehouse guys <clears throat> and I would go to the warehouse foreman and I would tell him, hey, I know that this is extra work for you guys, but could you please have your guys bring down these certain extrusions of metal and organize them in this certain way because I need to take some photos of it for the website. And uh, I think they hated me for it. <laughs> I think they hated me for it. But the truth is that I made those freaking uh, web uh, uh, metal extrusions look sexy, man. I made them by playing around with angles and taking all the photos myself, and not just taking these standard head-on photos that were that are that were typical for the industry. I ended up being able to find cool ways of representing the 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 product that was being sold and then the website became something actually attractive it became something interesting to look at it became something different and uh that was actually something that i would go on to be recognized for several times during job interviews down the road they were like man you really (laughs) you really made those metal pieces look interesting and there's no way that i could have experienced that had i not walked through that open door that that was that that appeared in front of me. So I think that those two, those two things are very important. You know, um, challenge yourself creatively and don't look down on an opportunity just because it doesn't gather all the perfect set of circumstances for you. Um, take a risk. Nothing is permanent. You know, you can always go in, experience it, have that experience, it add that onto your portfolio, and then walk in a different direction. But don't turn things down just because they're they don't seem completely ideal for you at the moment. Everything can be turned into a creative learning experience. I think to end this interview, uh, is there any advice you would give people who are unsure on which career path to take? Yeah. Um, I think, um, you know, experiment, especially, you know, if you're young, if you are fresh out of high school, you're about to graduate or you've been, you know, doing just going through uh, uh, prerequisites and in college or whatever it is, and you're still trying to figure your 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 path out. uh, I think that the quickest that you can get a taste for the subject matters that you're interested in, the better. You know, this is this is your laboratory time. This is your experimental time. And it is something that should be used to its maximum potential, not just in going through the motions, not just in saying, well, I'm not sure about what I'm going to you know, focus on. So I'm just going to go for this. And then walking down that path kind of blindly experiment a little bit, you know, take a course from this thing that interests you here. Take a course from that other thing that interests you over there, you know, take squeeze in a course into each semester. It feels, it feels to me like a lot of times, um, when somebody's trying to figure out their path in, in higher education, there's this sense of urgency that trumps the opportunity to taste test different fields. And I think that's a problem. Um, we are shot out of high school with the sense that like we have to run through this predefined course so that we can get to the other end and all right, now I'm adult, now I'm adult, now I can start making real money or whatever. But no, I, I feel like, you know, if you took an entire semester to just take courses from different 
practices, different folk, different um, different majors, uh, just for the purpose of testing out the subject matter and seeing if it truly interests you, you should go for that. I was talking to my sister as well, who is um, 19 right now. Not too long ago, we were in a conversation about a similar topic. And I was telling her, you know, why don't you, while you're in school, go volunteer somewhere. You know, she was very interested in the, in the, the whole world of, um, nonprofit management. And I told her, go volunteer for a couple of nonprofits, you know, because no two nonprofits are alike and nonprofits are a world where you could find two different companies that operate in one same space, but because nonprofits don't usually run in the way that corporate establishments run. It's very dependent on the person who is running them, the director of that nonprofit, how the culture and how the business is is run. Go volunteer for this nonprofit for a month and then volunteer for another nonprofit for a month. You know, get a taste test of what it actually is in real time, in the real world. See if their work excites you in some way. And I would say the same thing for anyone. You know, if you have the opportunity while you're in school to go and volunteer, uh, to go and, and get your feet on the ground and really experiment with what that prospect of a career path that you're contemplating is go and do that go and do that there's no rush especially if you're young there's no rush just go and uh go and 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 get your feet wet see if it's see which one calls to you more the bottom line is to me um and i know that this is really based off of you know my experience but to me passion matters a lot and if my heart isn't in what i'm doing then I'm going to go in a different direction. Uh, I feel like we spend so much of our time in uh, the places that we work that if I'm miserable during that time, that means that I'm miserable for a big chunk of my life. And that's just simply not something that I'm willing to, to really tolerate in my personal life. And so I recommend the same to, you know, to anybody who is trying to define their career path. Um, Find your passion. Discover something that you can actually become passionate about. You know, it it uh, it can only happen if you test it out. And you can test it out. Do internships. You know, go volunteer. You know, take different courses from from different majors to you know get a taste for for what uh, for what the actual content is like. And make sure that whatever you pick is something that you say, yeah, I can see myself doing this, you know, for years down the road. I think that that's uh, some of the, the better advice that I could give somebody who's in that position of finding out and defining their career. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think uh, I think that's good. I really I really enjoyed the the chat. I really appreciate the time. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Remember to share this podcast with your friends if they're unsure on which career path to take. Follow us on Instagram at Prosperous Lives One and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Prosperous Lives. Thank you guys for listening. Until next time.